One of the things I appreciate about John as we're looking at 1 John is that he is uh, a wordsmith. He uses his language master, masterfully uh, and uses words to draw out meaning that doesn't quite always come through in the English as it does in the Greek. Their, their language was very precise and, and they had specific words that, that would mean certain things and yet in English we use the same words to mean lots of different things. So there's lots of shades of meaning and so forth. Like last week we looked at new and, and it could mean a couple of different things. Today we're going to look at the word world and love. Uh, you remember from John 3.16, right? You've seen it under the athlete's eyes. You all know the, the verse, for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that, you know, to save. We know that verse. Fifty years later, John's writing what we're going to look at today in in uh, 1 John 2, 15 through 17, it says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride and possessions, is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. Love here is... Again, in English, it means a lot of different things. Here, the primary meaning is that you have a strong preference towards something, like uh, I love chocolate cake as opposed to not loving cheesecake. <laughs> cheesecake, come on. You know. And so there's a strong preference there, and John says, don't love, have that strong preference for the world. And we, we know John's not talking about creation here because God created and he said it was good and he loves his world and we know that the heavens are declaring the glory of God and that that there's this general revelation that's in creation where it's shouting out the fact that there is a creator and that he is a master craftsman and and that he is drawing people and he's going to make a new heaven and a new earth and so God I don't think John's talking about here uh, talking about that here when he says don't love the world I think what he's talking about is what guys try to sum up here's a guy named Vincent who says the sum total of human life in the ordered world, considered apart from, alienated from, and hostile to God, and the earthly things which seduce from God. Here's another guy named Trench who said, All that floating mass of thoughts, opinions, maximums, maximum, maxims, speculations, hopes, impulses, aims, aspirations at any time current in the world, which it may be impossible to seize and accurately define, but which constitutes real and effective power, being the moral or immoral atmosphere, which at every moment of our lives we inhale, and again, inevitably, to exhale. In short, what they're talking about is a philosophy, a worldview. Sometimes we can't get our arms around it, we can't define it, but we know that it's there. It is a way of thinking. Much of the world is religious, but not Christ-like. They have a form of religion, but they are not Christ-based in that religion. Now, John is stating some pretty obvious things here. Uh, he learned from the best, <laughs> the best teacher that there was, that truth needs to be stated. Jesus was not all that concerned, I think, with uh, stating the truth and offending people. If you listen to what he really said, particularly the, the Pharisees and the religious folks, he would say things like, you know, you guys, you can't serve God and money. You can only have one God, and you have trying to have two. He says, you invalidate the law of God for your man-made rules. How come your disciples aren't washing their hands? You hypocrites! <laughs> you know, you're invalidating the very laws of God to keep your own little man-made rules. He's talking about these folks, and he says, look, they sit in a seat of authority, therefore listen to what they say, but don't do what they do, because they're hypocrites and they're liars. You strain a gnat, you swallow a camel, you're, you're, you're whitewashed on the outside, but inside you're full of just junk and garbage, you're a bunch of snakes, and so forth. Jesus was not all that concerned about offending those folks that clearly needed to have a word of the Lord. And John isn't either. <laughs> when you read through his book, you get here and he says things like this, there is only room for one love. Don't love the world. If you do, the love of the Father is not in you. It's not vague. See, there's a war that goes on between kingdoms. There is no fence straddling in the kingdom. We are either in the kingdom or we're not in the kingdom. We are either children of God or we are children of the devil. Mankind has rebelled against God. It comes, we are born with this nature that is hostile 
to God. It's called a sin nature. And choosing the side of rebellion aligns us with the devil and his anti-Christian views. John's very clear on this. The Gospels are clear on this. There is no neutral. You're either for or you're against. You cannot serve darkness and light, John has been saying. You cannot be in both. <laughs> they displace. You cannot do both of them. Like I said, many are religious, but they've not bowed their knee to the true king. They have not bowed their knee and their heart to the Lord and say, you be Lord. They're saying the world is Lord. We are loving the things of the world. And he says, no, that's not right. God sent his son to redeem us and them. He loved us that much. And C.S. Lewis said, you will fight your way through the love of God to reject him because it's constantly there. And, and he loves us so very much. But make no mistake about it. There are only two choices. And no matter how much our world says and how much that philosophy screams to us that all roads lead to heaven, that's not true. There is Jesus, and then there's not Jesus. There's the kingdom of God, and then there is everything else. That just is the way it is. And he says, if you, don't, if you love the world and all that that entails, and you are strongly drawn to and, and want that, embrace that, and so forth, the love of God's not in you. The love of the Father is not in you. That's pretty clear if we think about it. James put it this way, You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. That's pretty black and white. <laughs> There's a choice. You have the demonic kingdom. You have the eternal heavenly kingdom. Which one are we in? Paul put it this way, and I know this gets small, but he says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. You love the world? You're an enemy of God. Are we alive or are we dead? Those are the choices that are before us. John says, you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. Because Jesus came, the verse I started with, you must be born again. By being born again, not only are we made new in Christ, but we died everything else that was there. It is a complete, total change. We change kingdoms. Everything changes. And we embrace the kingdom of God. We reject the kingdom of our enemy and our foe. Now, we're not instantly taken to heaven one of my major frustrations, or in the new earth or wherever we're going to end up, people fuss about that. But what it means is that we're left here as citizens of another country. We change allegiance. We are now part of the kingdom of God. We are now ambassadors for Christ. We now represent a foreign government <laughs> that is the government of God. And we are strangers and aliens here, right? Jesus, when he was doing his great high priestly prayer, Towards the end of his life there in John 17, he says, I don't ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world just as I am not of the world. Thus we have that old saying that says we are in the world but not of the world. There is that distinction that is there. We remain in this world after salvation. Most of us don't die on our... Don't die. Most of us don't come to the Lord that are in here anyway on our deathbed. We meet the Lord and then we live a certain amount of time because God wants us to do things and to represent Him. So what's our view of the world? Why is it reflective of, of what's in our hearts? John says if you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. Well, it's that way because John goes on and explains it here. And he says, for all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. They translate lust as desire, strong desires of the flesh, eyes, pride of life. The, the translators fuss about how you should translate and what all it means. But the truth is, I think we all would admit we deal with these three areas of our life on a fairly regular basis. That is summing up what's in the world. These three are kind of primary. You think about Jesus' temptations. The devil comes to him and he, he hasn't eaten in 40 days. And he says, take these stones and turn them into bread. He's appealing to the flesh. He says, you can do this. And Jesus said, no, I'm not going to do that. And he says, here's the kingdoms of the world. They're mine. I'll give them to you. And, and, and so he's, he's appealing to that whole I thing, seeing it all. He says, nope, not going to do that. I got an idea. Think of yourself very highly. Throw yourself off because the word says he'll keep you and so forth. He says, get away from me. 
But that temptations were there in these three primary arenas. And even Adam and Eve, if you think back to the first one that's recorded for us, what was it all about? Hey, there's, a, there's the tree. There's that piece of cheese hanging there that, that you know, was good for food. Okay. All right. All right. You caught that. All right. It's, it's a Hebrew translation thing. It, it was... He said, it's good for food. It's lovely to look at, which I know it isn't cheese then in that case. And, and then the whole pride thing, that you'll be like God. What's appealing to those three areas again? Galatians 5, Paul talks about the flesh. Let's read this. I'll read it to you. He says, but I say to you, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envies, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who have belonged to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Let us not provoke, let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Paul's laying out the battle of that first element of the flesh. As we look back over our lives, as we analyze this last week or maybe this morning or this day or, or whatever, where are we in that? Are we much more in the deeds of the flesh or are we in the fruit of the Spirit? Where are we in that? John says, all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the desires of the flesh, if, if we focus there, if that's our motivation, if that's our driving force, the love of the Father is not in us. Now, we're bombarded with these temptations and desires on a regular basis, but what do we do with them? <laughs> what do we do with them? There's this, there's this issue, this battle going on. What do we love? Do we love those things or do we love the fruit of the Spirit? Which one are we after? Jesus went on talking about the second one where, where he said about the eyes. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. Most of us are bombarded daily with temptations through here, aren't we? With the advent of the internet, with you know, driving and billboards and people and, and the whole bit. And it isn't all just you know, sexual lust and things like that. Envy, coveting. Wishing we were or, or, or somebody else or could be like so-and-so. There's lots of things that go through the eyes that we've got to take captive to the obedience of Christ. And not just the ones that we normally think of. Comparing ourselves to other people. Making judgments about them on partial information and so forth. Those are issues that, that he says, if that stuff is in you, step back. <laughs> and say, this is the flesh, this is the, this is the world, according to John's definition. If these things are in you, this is worldly. And then he gets to pride. The scripture is so full of, uh, of the issue of pride that it's hard to even know where to pick verses from, but it's all over the place. The fear of the Lord is a hatred of evil, pride and arrogance and the way of evil and perverted speech. I hate. <laughs> the Lord doesn't say a whole lot of things that he hates, but when he does, we need to listen. And he says, I hate this. Okay, God, I do not want to go there. I do not want to have that in my life. James talks about God opposing us. I guarantee you that if God is on the opposite side of us, we are in trouble, period. And he says he gives more grace to the humble. Therefore, it says God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Amen. This particular word in, in the Greek that John is referring to with the with the lust of the eyes and lust of the flesh and the, and the pride of life, it, it, it has to do with particularly being arrogant and conceited and prideful about our life or our livelihood. It has to do with, with being, uh, thinking more highly of, the, uh, of us than we are. Empty bragging about what we can do or have done. Uh, trusting in the earthly things that God has given us. You know, all of this stuff we have is a gift from God. And if we put our trust in it, we are going to be deeply disappointed. Because as I say all the time, everything we see can go like that. You can bend over and straighten up a rug, apparently, 
and fall down and, in, and incur a major disaster. It made me think of me doing that back there in the back all the time on that rug. <laughs> okay, young guys, I'm turning it over to you. You need to start doing that. I thought about this boastful word. The, the old English word, is, those of you that still read the King James, it's vainglory. What a word. You know, vainglory. You're building your life on the sand. What a picture. If you're trusting in this stuff, in the things that are here, it is vain. And the storms come, and that stuff gets blown away and washed downstream. Man, just don't do it. <laughs> it says the pride of life. It, it's, it's taking all of your investments and putting them someplace where you know that moth and rust is going to destroy it. And that's called the earth. That's called this world. <laughs> when we put all of our hope there, we are inviting destruction of those things. So John's laid out this contrast between those who know the Father, are strong in the Word, they're walking in the light, they're learning how to walk in love towards each other, as opposed to those who are dominated by the flesh, what they see, by the pride of this life. And he says the, the contrast could not be clearer. One is from the world, in love with the world, and one is from the Father. One is bowed to the king of this world, the, the God of this world, and the other one is bowed before the King of kings and Lord of lords. One has said, your will be done, Father. One has said, your will be done, devil, whether they know it or not. Wow. And all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the eyes, so forth, says it's not from the Father. <laughs> those three things, and you can spend the rest of your, your days trying to figure out what all those three things are. There's enough books written on it. But he says, it's not from the Father. The, the mushy middle that existed, exists in our day was not the gospel's understanding. Life, death. Light, darkness. In, out. Alive, dead. Serving Christ, not serving Christ. Boom. Shh. Father's love in our hearts, the world's love in our hearts. Where are we? <laughs> Which one are we doing? And he goes on and he says the future of these things is set. All that's in the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. One is already full of death and decay and is going to end in more death and decay. The other is going to endure forever in love, joy, peace. One's going to end in darkness and flames and unquenchable despair, and one will end in never-ending light, love, joy, peace, and so forth. Which one do we want? <laughs> Where do we want to go? Lust is never satisfied. Peace, joy, contentment, Worship, love will continue to meet our needs for all of eternity. It will satisfy. Hell will be a place where the worm of desire demands to be fed, yet always remains hungry. Love, joy, peace, rest will be a dream. It will never happen in that place. And if we go down that path and end up there, we are going to be so sad and so upset and miserable. And the torment, at least part of the torment, is going to be over what we don't have and can't get at that point. He says, if you've got this stuff in you, the world and all the stuff that's in it is passing away. It is not permanent. The lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, those things will never meet the needs that are there, and they will always leave you in torment. They will take you someplace worse than where you can imagine when you give in to that. Why would we want to do that as believers? It says, on the contrary, the one who's walking, seeking out the will of God will always end up in the best place. It may not always look that way to us now, and that's simply because we do not have all the information. When we get more information, the light often dawns there. And we're going, this is really a bad thing. Really? Maybe it isn't a bad thing. Maybe this is really a good thing that's just packaged funny or packaged differently than what you thought it should be. And whereas we're, we're looking at something and saying, oh, I wish I could have that, I wish I could have that, and God says, no, I want you to have this, which way are we going to go? Where are we going to find satisfaction? Which one is ultimately going to produce love, joy, peace in our life? God's will done in God's way is always the right choice. Amen. Following the world and following its logical conclusion of where it's going to end up is death, destruction, decay, frustration, heartache, disappointment. We don't want to end up there. Our God delights in redeeming, restoring, enhancing, bringing life. The enemy delights in killing, stealing, destroying. The world is going to take us down that path, 
Loving the Father is going to take us down the other path. Which one do we want to go? When we get up and we say, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thy will be done in my life as it is in heaven is so much better prayer than to say, I want everything that the world has to offer. I want the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. That's not where we want to end up. That is not where we want to go. So as I, as I thought about these few verses and I thought about this contrast, a bunch of questions came to my mind, and they're all like what questions, but what place does the world's way of thinking have in our heart, in my heart, in your heart? As you, as you think about it, you're okay, okay, the world has this particular view, this way of thinking. It, it has these motivations, and it has this whole value system that's there. And he, and he said sometimes it's hard to grasp, but we all have an idea of what it is in our mind probably. This is the world's way of doing it. What place does that have in my heart and in your heart? Am I totally in God's kingdom? <laughs> have I bowed my heart and knee before the Lord? And said, Jesus, I want you to be Lord of my life, all of it. Yes. So we sing the songs today. God, I want you before your throne. I don't want to try to straddle the fence. I don't want to walk, try to walk in two different directions at the same time. It doesn't work. And it'll just produce death in our life. Where are we at in that? The world's way of thinking. And what does that mean to you? <laughs> when, he, when he says... Don't love this world. Don't be in this world. What does that mean to you? We all are existing here, most of us anyway. We're alive, we're breathing, we're existing. So what does it mean to be in this world but not of this world? What does it mean to you? We all have a way of thinking about this, but unless you make this personal, you're going to miss some of what the Lord has for you. What does that mean to you where you live and work, where you have your uh, main amount of time? means something to you, right? But what does it mean? And these three things that John says, if this is in you, this is, this is the world. Don't love the world. All that's in there, the desires of the flesh and the eyes and the boastful pride of life, what does that mean to you? I scratched the surface on them a little bit. But what does it mean to you where you live? It, it's a good thing to think about. As you leave here today, as you get up and go do the things you're going to do tomorrow, what does that mean? Okay, I, I, I want to have the love of the Father in my heart. I don't want to love the world. I'm being bombarded with all of this stuff. How do I deal with this? What do I do? What does it mean? Because I think if we start to understand what it means, we can figure out how to overcome it, how to resist it, how to recognize it. You have to become familiar with what's coming in in order to figure out how to deal with it, right? Yes, that's right. Yes. So... What do does, what does John's words mean regarding loving the world and it's not from the Father? What does that mean? It should mean something to us as we think about it. He's making this contrast. Isn't that what he said? If you, if you love the world, if you are there, then the love of the Father is not in you. What does that mean? Does it speak of being born again? If my drawing and, and everything in me draws to the world... Where's the Spirit of God in my heart and life? If you're not born again, if you have not become a new creation in Christ, if you have not stepped out of death into life, if you have not stepped from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, there's nothing but the world for you. And if you're in here today and you're not sure or you don't know where you are, then you need to settle that and you need to deal with it. And you need to find out what's really in your heart. What does the do you have the love of the Father in your heart? <laughs> and it, it's a yes or no answer. It really is. You know, we all fall short and we all fail and we all make mistakes and we all give in to temptation. We all do the things like that. But I'm talking about root level, have you been born again? Because that's where we start. And as we do that, then the things of this world start to grow strangely dim their hold over us begins to break. And we start shying away from those things and walking towards the things that bring life. Where are you today? Do you know the Lord? Have you made that decision? Have you yielded your life to Him? What does it mean that the love of the Father is not in you? It either is or it isn't. And then where he ended these two verses is doing the will of God. What does that mean? For you, what does that mean? Does God have a specific will for you? Does He have a plan, a purpose for you? Does He have things He wants you to do? 
We are his workmanship, right? Created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he ordained for us to do beforehand. He has things for us to do. So if I'm doing them, am I in the will of God? If I'm refusing to do what the Lord has told me to do, am I out of the will of God? I mean, we've got to think through these things. What does it mean? It says if, if you're loving the world, those things are passing away. But the things that are going to remain, the things that are going to produce fruit for eternity, that are beyond rust and moth and stealing and destruction and crashing and burning like that house on the sand, those things are in the will of God. Those are the things that God has called us to do. So it's a good question to stop every once in a while and say, okay, God, I pray this prayer. Your kingdom come, your will be done. The next question is, what does that mean? <laughs> and what's it look like in my life? What is it you want me to do? Is God able to tell us such things? Yes, He is. That's the correct answer. He is. He is able to tell us that. Yes. He's able to give us direction and clarity. So I want to pray as you think about these things. Some good what questions to go back. Lord, there's a lot packed into these verses. And I just scratched the surface just to kind of turn up a couple of things for us to contemplate and think about. And Lord, would you please show us the answer to these questions? And I'm, I'm grateful for this day that we have. What an opportunity where we can come together as a body and worship and pray, talk about the things of your word, fellowship with each other, to be able to put into practice the things that you show us. God, thank you for that. And Lord, I thank you that it's a new day. If there's someone here that doesn't know you, Lord, I, I pray they would start today, that they would meet you, that they would begin the rest of their life now. <laughs> they would change kingdoms. I wouldn't buy the lies that says it doesn't matter and there's all, every way is fine. No, it isn't. Your word is true. You said you're the only way, that all of us are heading away from you. And we have to bow our heart and knee and turn to you, find forgiveness and salvation through repentance. Lord, I, I pray that we would turn to you, no matter where we may be today. Those that are believers that maybe have walked a long way from you, God, I pray they would turn today, that today would be the beginning. They turn around and you'll run to them. God, thank you for a new day. Thank you for your grace. God, I thank you that this life is not all there is. That you have promised us eternal life. And it's so different than the destination of those who love the world. <laughs> Lord, we're heading to life and more life, eternal life, without sin, without sickness, without disease full of love, joy, peace, happiness, purpose.